There is an abundance of evidence showing that marriages or sexual relations between members of the nuclear family, like your parents and children, were common amongst royalty or special classes of priests since they were the representatives of divine on earth. They were often privileged to do what was forbidden to members of the ordinary family. During the Ptolemaic period, the practice was even used by Pharaoh Ptolemy II as a major theme of stressing the nature of the couple, which could not be bound by ordinary rules of humanity. If you're new to my channel, welcome. Here on Mortal Faces, I take historic portraits to see how individuals we read about might have looked in real life, and I also untangle their family trees. So let's get started. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more historic recreations and trees. And let me know in the comments who you want to see in upcoming videos. For more than 3,000 years, the pharaoh was the political and religious leader in ancient Egypt. He or she held the titles Lord of the Two Lands and High Priest of Every Temple and was considered a god on earth. From Narmer to Cleopatra, the pharaohs owned all the land in Egypt, collected taxes, declared war, and defended the country. And like many of their European counterparts, inbreeding to keep the bloodline pure was not an uncommon practice. The ancient Egyptian royal families were almost expected to marry within the family, as inbreeding was present in virtually every dynasty. Pharaohs were not only wed to their brothers and sisters, but there were also uncle-niece marriages where a man married a girl whose parents were his own brother and sister. It is believed that the pharaohs did this because of the ancient belief that the god Osiris married his sister Isis to keep their bloodline pure and ironically their mission was to bring civilization to humanity to teach about the practice of government, religion, marriage, and morality. We'll look at two of the most well-known dynasties that ruled ancient Egypt and see how the tangled web was spun. I do have individual videos outlining how they might have looked in their real lives and their family trees, but let's review them here, shall we? This is King Tut's inbred family tree, but in a printable poster form. If you haven't seen already my most popular video, it's where I explain this in detail, so starting now, I want to give you the version where you can print it and have your very own hard copy of this crazy family tree. You can purchase it off my shop, the link is in the description. Put it on your wall, or if you need a weird and wacky gift, no one would expect you to give something like this. So I'm going to go through this poster and tell you what it encompasses. To begin, there are two versions, one where we have a recreation of how he might have looked in real life, and the second replaces that with his sarcophagus. Everything else is the same. We have the title, and then we have the family tree. King Tut is at the bottom, and starting at the top, we go through his family dynasty and his family members that ruled ancient Egypt. The total time encompasses around 200 years. At the top, we have the seventh king of the 17th dynasty. King Seneca Tenere Amos, he married a woman of non-royal birth, Tetishri. They had four children and Sekenere Tau became the eighth king of the 17th dynasty. He married his three sisters and had children with each of them. With Amos and Api, he had Amos Hanetumehu, with Sejuhuti, a daughter, and Ahotep I, he had Kamos, Amos I, and Amos Nefertari. Kamos became the ninth king of the 17th dynasty and his only daughter married his brother or her uncle, Amos I. Amos I got the throne after his older brother died without male heirs. Amos I was the founder of the 18th dynasty. He married his niece, also his half-sister, Amos Enetumehu, and his full sister, Amos Nefertari. With Nefertari, he had three children with her. Amenhotep I became the second pharaoh of the 18th dynasty and married his full sister Amos Meritamon, and also Ahotep II, who we don't know for sure where she came from. She was just referred to as wife and sister. Either way, unfortunately, he had no surviving heirs. So when he died, the throne passed to Tutmose I. Tutmose I was the third pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. He was a soldier and the earliest direct ancestor to King Tut. It is unknown how he got the throne, perhaps he was the best friend to Amenhotep I, or loosely related to the royal family. But to secure his throne, he married members of the previous ruler's family, including the royal sister Matnofret, 
and also Amos. With Amos, we don't know exactly who she is. She could possibly be the daughter of Amenhotep I, the daughter of Amos I, the same person as Amos Nefertari, or even Thutmose's very own sister. With Amos, they had Hatshepsut, and with Mutnofret, they had Thutmose II. Thutmose II and Hatshepsut, his half-sister, Mary, but they have no surviving heirs. Thutmose II became the fourth pharaoh, but when he died, his half-sister became the fifth pharaoh. However, as I mentioned, they had no heirs. Thutmose II, though, married another woman of unknown origins, and they had a child who became Thutmose III. He married a daughter of a noble, Hatshepsut Merieter, and they had Amenhotep II, who married Tia'a, who was either his sister or half-sister, and they had Thutmose IV, who married Mutemwea, the daughter of a noble. Then they had Amenhotep III. He was the ninth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. He was the wealthiest pharaoh of the dynasty and King Tut's grandfather. He not only married T, the daughter of a non-royal landowner, but also his own daughters Sitamun and Iset, who he possibly fathered children with. He had two more children, Amenhotep IV and the younger lady. Amenhotep IV also changed his name to Akhenaten and married Nefertiti and his sister, the younger lady. With his sister, the younger lady, they had King Tut, and with Nefertiti, they had Ankhonsenamun. King Tut was the 13th pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. Before he got the throne, there might have been two other pharaohs after his father died because King Tut was so young. Either way, he was the last pharaoh of the family to rule. He married his half-sister Ankhonsenamun, however their two daughters never survived. He was succeeded by his advisor Ai, and then Horemheb, the chief of the army. Then the 18th dynasty ends. And that's the family tree, it's from 1560 to 1323 BCE. In this section here we have info on Tut himself. He was about 5 feet 6 inches and inherited an overbite. He had a cleft palate and scoliosis. One foot was flat while the other was clubbed with bone necrosis. He walked with a limp and a cane at 18 years old and then he fell and fractured his leg and he also had sickle cell anemia. So it's safe to say he did not win the genetic lottery. Finally, at the bottom here we have a timeline to show where this 18th dynasty is in the history of ancient Egypt. The Pyramid of Giza was over 1000 years old when King Tut was alive and Cleopatra wouldn't be born for another 1200 years. And that's this poster, which you can purchase. Link in the description. Cleopatra VII, on the other hand, was the last pharaoh of Egypt and was the most famous member of the Ptolemaic dynasty, which ruled ancient Egypt for 275 years from 305 to 30 BCE. Incestuous relationships were so common in the Ptolemaic dynasty that Ptolemy II is often given the nickname Philadelphus, a word used to describe the marriage to his sister Arsinoe II. Almost every pharaoh of the dynasty thereafter was married to his or her brother or sister. Ptolemy II's heir, Ptolemy III, did not marry a sister, but he did marry his first half-cousin, Bernike II. It wasn't until the next generation that we see another marriage between a full brother and sister, Ptolemy IV and Arsinoe III, that resulted in Ptolemy V, who was the first offspring of a Ptolemaic sibling marriage. This trend continued within the family up to the birth of the famous Cleopatra VII. Her father was Ptolemy XII, and her mother was her father's first cousin, first cousin once removed, and half-niece. Marrying within the royal family meant never having to dilute their Macedonian blood with that of the native Egyptians. It also meant foreign powers couldn't infiltrate Egypt. It seems as if the Ptolemies would have then produced a number of offspring with genetic disorders, but none appear to have significantly suffered from inbreeding. Nevertheless, inbreeding worked in their favor and helped to keep the rule of Egypt in the hands of the Ptolemies for almost 300 years. And that brings us to the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. You can continue to see Cleopatra's full recreation and the story of her family tree in my next video. Subscribe for more trees and recreations. Each of your subscriptions does help this channel grow. It allows me to continue making more videos for you. Let me know in the comments who you want to see in upcoming videos. I do make a list of all your suggestions and I will see you in the next one.